Happy Saturday night. So glad to have you join us tonight. Tonight's message is from last Sunday. So you can still interact with us. Send us a message. In fact, at the end of this message, send an email to our pastor on what God showed you through this. And remember that tomorrow morning, which is Sunday, we have our on-campus worship at 9.30 and 11. And tomorrow online, you can watch us at 9.30, 11, and 8 p.m. Look forward to seeing you on our campus or online this next week. My name is Elliot Higgins. I am the executive pastor here at Southcliff. Uh, our senior pastor, Dr. Marr, is out today. He will be back uh, next week. But we're continuing in a series that he began some time back. Uh, small books, big message, big meaning. That, that even though these books are rather small in Scripture, they carry a lot of weight. So today, we're actually coming to a book called Philemon. It's kind of an interesting one to find. It's in the New Testament. It's literally the page right before Hebrews. So as you're thumbing through, Hebrews is a fairly large book. It's the page right before it. Uh, and so I have a picture that I want to put up on the screen for you if you're here in person or, or at home. This very first picture I thought captured Philemon in, a, in an artistic way. Do you see my pillar here? Do you like this pillar? I thought that this pillar was something that could really show the content of Philemon. And some of you are looking at my pillar saying, I, I see the pillar, but I also see a couple of faces there. Thank you for critiquing me in my picture. So if that doesn't do it for you, let me show you another picture. Now this one I think will help. You see a rabbit, right? You see a rabbit here? Some of you say, I see a duck. Thanks again, keep your mouth closed. Let's look at another one. This one you can't miss, all right? Do you see the young woman? Some of you are saying, I see the old lady. I don't see the young woman. I don't get this. One more for you. Do you see the little girl? Some of you are seeing a whole lot of different things. What's interesting with each of these, now these are optical illusions, every one of them. It doesn't matter what you're seeing in those. You can see the pillar and there's faces. You can see the old woman and there's a young woman. They're all in the exact same image. But what you're going to discover is, is based on your perspective or your point of view, you're seeing something, but someone else seeing the exact same image comes out with an entirely different perspective. It's the same picture. But now there's a division. No, I see the old lady. No, I see the young woman. Well, they're both in that picture if you look closely enough. And same with any one of these, that you can look at the same thing and there's this polarized opinion that comes from it. What we see in our society through social media, especially, is we can watch how a three-second video clip, maybe as long as 10 seconds, people are watching the same thing and they come with two entirely different points of view. And it becomes polarizing. As in, people are saying, this is a hill that I'm going to die on. I have seen enough. I've seen this. And I know what I think about it. And then the other side of it says, no, I saw the same video. And I see this. How dare you not see what I'm seeing? It's the same image, the same video. And we end up with different points of view polarizing our society is polarized on so many issues that we can literally divide a country over a three second video people are watching the same thing and coming with different conclusions now the reason why i bring this up is philemon almost is like an ancient day social media post if i can put it that way where as you read it there are this, these two different points of view that emerge. And as we read it and we're introduced to the two people on the pages of Scripture here, we recognize that one person, we say, look, this person is a man of God, Philemon. Actually, we, we see his life play out before us and say, what an incredible guy, how he seems to be a church leader. He seems to be very well connected with his family. He seems to, to love God and love others and is pouring himself out. And then we see Onesimus. And Onesimus is a slave. He ran away trying to achieve freedom. He was a slave to Philemon. And now there's another polarized perspective that many in the room would say, wait a minute, 
Here is this guy who seems to be affluent and he seems to have all the position. And though he says he's a man of God, he owns a slave. And Philemon is, is oppressing Onesimus. And Onesimus is trying to get loose from that. And now we see another perspective. And what Paul is doing through this book <clears throat> that he's writing to Philemon and ultimately recorded in scripture for us is he is taking these two divided parts polarized viewpoints all of the friction and struggle here and he is bringing them together in a unique way and he is taking away that polarization that dichotomy this this feuding faction and he's bringing peace to the situation and many of us in the room today have come here with a challenge that when we go to the workplace tomorrow we recognize that there is a challenge. I'm at war with other employees in this organization. They're not seeing it the way that I'm seeing it. They're saying, you are lazy. You're not getting the job done. And you turn and look and say, but I am getting the job done. I'm burning the candle from both ends trying to make this work. And there's this feud. Many of us go home after church today, and there are people in our families that that we just butt heads. We see things entirely differently. Maybe there are people in your family that you haven't spoken with in years because it has become so polarized and so divisive. The same thing. You can go home to your husband or wife and say, look, you're just sitting on the couch doing nothing right now. I have done this and this and this and this all day and you're doing nothing. And the point of view from that person is saying, I've been doing this, 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 this while you were doing that and I need a break. It's polarizing. So how do we navigate? How do we navigate this in a healthy way? Many of us are stressed out because of the relationship dynamics that we have people that we don't want to talk to people that we we are polar opposite in the way that we view things and it creates this friction and we don't want it you are so stressed out you carry it in your shoulders you have a headache you don't want to talk to these people you've put all of these boundaries in place and it's stressful philemon brings peace in what we see paul do is take this this division and bring it about philemon brings about this peace so let's look together at the book of philemon hopefully you found it that one page right before hebrews and what we're going to see is that paul is writing this letter bringing about peace when you leave here today you're going to be able to take a deep breath and experience a peace in your life especially if you're dealing with these these challenges of this polarized opinion and all the the relationship drama that you may possess in your life you're going to have the tools to bring that down and have peace. Perhaps that's why God brought you here today, is that you're so stressed out and there's so much friction in your family, in your friends, and in your, your workplace. So let's look with us, look together at this letter to Philemon. I'm reading out of the ESV, so if you have a different translation, they're saying the same thing. Just keep up with me. We'll be just fine. Let's look at this. Verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pause here for just a second. Paul begins this message. Paul begins this message just saying, I am a prisoner for Christ Jesus. A prisoner. So Paul is an apostle. He has literally seen the resurrected Lord. He has gone and taken the gospel in places that no one else has gone before. He is bold. He is strong. He is working tirelessly for the gospel. And he has this level of authority about him. But in the first statement, he says, I'm a prisoner. To begin with this, he is showing this dichotomy already from the pages i am not only an apostle if you're viewing me that way but i'm also a prisoner that apostle has command authority prominence the prisoner has nothing i go where you say to go i do what you tell me to do i have no means to do other than that and so we see this dichotomy beginning with this book to philemon a beloved fellow worker 
Now, Paul is writing this to Philemon, this fellow worker. He is a believer. He is committed to the case of Christ, Apphia, and Archippus. We don't know exactly who these two are, but the assumption is, is that this is his wife and his son. His son, the way that this is read, this fellow soldier, this kind of language, seems to indicate that he has some level of influence in the church, perhaps a pastor, a shepherd, that kind of a thing, where he is having a position of authority, taking the gospel forward and protecting the flock. So Philemon, we're already being introduced to the fact that he seems to be a man who not only loves God, he manages his family well, his family loves the Lord, and they are sold out and committed to him. And Paul continues to begin with this, says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, grace is the means to the peace. God's grace is what brings about peace in our life. Paul is saying, though there's this dichotomy here, I am the apostle, but I'm a prisoner, and he's going to begin to lay out these two characters in the scripture, but through God's grace, now there is peace. And this is what he wishes on Philemon. This is what he wishes on Onesimus. This is what he wishes on all of the people here in Scripture. So all of that, as we begin, God's desire for you is that you have peace with this divisive nature of relationships. So let's keep reading. And he introduces us further to Philemon. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Here's the thing that we're, we're beginning to see this image of Philemon develop. And he's saying, I, I'm remembering you in my prayers because I am hearing of what? Love and faith. So it's not something in the past where we say, you know, Back in the old days, things were good. God was doing really well, and, and we were seeing people come to Christ, and we experienced that. He's saying, right now, I'm still hearing about your continued desire to exhibit your love and your faith to each of these people. And it's reaching my ears, and I'm in prison. It's not like I'm just wandering around. I'm still hearing this, even though I'm locked up. So your faithfulness is huge. And it's not only just for the Lord, but you love God's people, and you're doing it well and he says i pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of christ may everything you do may god bless it in a way that you see every good thing that god has in store for you and the people of god may you bring that out may the god bring every good thing up for i have derived much joy and comfort from your love my brother because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Imagine the Apostle Paul saying that about your life, that he is literally bringing, he is receiving comfort, and the people of God are refreshed because of your action. Because of your faithfulness to God, it is literally refreshing the apostles, it is refreshing the saints, and it is a good thing. So here we have Philemon, and we say, what an incredible person this is how he has been so faithful and loving and kind and gracious and diligent in the things of God. There's that image, and many in the room would say, that's what I want to teach my children to be like. That's what I want to be like. Now, let's flip the coin on the other side. Paul begins to introduce another character on the pages of the Scripture, and he says this in verse 8. It says, accordingly... I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Yet for love's sake, I appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but he is indeed useful to you and me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Onesimus, as, as we continue to read, we recognize is a slave. He was owned by Philemon. Now all of a sudden, many of us in the room, our, our senses develop and we say, wait a minute, Philemon here is a man seemingly of wealth, position, he is godly, but he owns another human being. That's not okay. Onesimus deserves to have his freedom. In ancient Rome, 
slavery was a big thing. It was very much even different than what we recognize in American history. In some ways it was the same, but in many ways it was very different. What we recognize in ancient Rome, one out of every three people were slaves. It was a big deal in ancient Rome. And you could have become a slave by being conquered, the, the Roman army conquering your people, and some of them are sold into slavery. You could have been sold into slavery because you couldn't pay a debt. It could have been that the crops failed and you owe, and now you're sold into slavery in order to pay for what you borrowed. could have been that you were an impulsive gambler and you lost a bunch of money and you were in debt and they sold you into slavery. could have been that you as a child were sold into slavery because your family didn't want you or your family was trying to pay a debt or all of those. There's a whole lot of dynamics that we don't know about Onesimus, but one thing we do know, it's not good to be a slave. You don't experience the freedom. You don't have the same care and provision, period. And it's, it's not something you aspire to be naturally. So now there's a whole other group of people that are looking at this saying, no, I want to stand here with Onesimus. He is a victim. He is being oppressed by a society. He is being oppressed by people. And here we have somebody who is a man of God who owns another human being. That is not okay. Do you see this polarization beginning to, to develop? And Paul is taking this this nature of these two ideas that are not only ingrained in the culture, in the people, in the history, in their life story, much of which we don't see here in this letter, but there's a whole lot of backstory we don't know as we do with any three second video clip on social media. There's a whole lot more to this story than what we know, but Paul is getting to the heart of this. So here's the first thing that we see in what we have read. How is it that we deal with this polarized position? How do we deal with challenging people that are viewing life from a very different perspective? There is a feud, a friction, a disagreement that brings stress and struggle and strife in our life. How do we deal with that? If God's design is to bring peace into your life, that all of this struggle and stress that we have with these people is not meant to be, how do we go about doing it? I want to draw your attention back up to verse 8. There are several key things that Paul is saying here that's hinting at our first point. He's saying, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. There's a word command. Verse 9, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. Appeal. In other words, I could command it. There's a level of authority, but this appeal, because you already know what you need to be doing. And then he talks about Onesimus, and in verse 12 he says, I am sending him. Send. So throughout this whole concept, he's, he's saying, I have the authority to command you, but because there is an authority here, you already know what you need to do. And because there's an authority here, Onesimus is on his way. This sent, command, and appeal. All of these things are pointing back to a higher authority. There is something else that is laying the foundation from everything else. And it leads to this first point. We, we have to recognize if we're going to deal with a divided culture, divided relationship, polarized, all of the issues that go with it, we have to recognize that Jesus is the authority. Number one, Jesus is the authority. So because of that, that is so easy for us to say. We can say, you know what, that's right. Jesus is the authority, that's great. How do we do that? How do we get peace out of knowing that Jesus is the authority? Well, we recognize that, that when we are looking at this problem, this relationship, it means that I set down all of the different things in my life that would be filtering my viewpoint. As in, these are my legal rights. These are things that the law says that I can have. In this case, slavery. He is obeying what the law says it could be. I'm setting that aside. It means that I'm putting down what I personally believe I have a right to. I have a right to not be a slave. I have a right, as Onesimus, I have a right to human freedom. Then we have also another box we need to sit down, how I feel about this whole thing. 
What we see in pages of scripture, Onesimus fled. It evidently cost Philemon a great deal of money. Whether it was stolen, it seems to imply that, but we don't know for sure. There was a cost that naturally there's these emotions that develop within both of these people. So in order for us to have this authority of Jesus, and we recognize that, we know that no matter what we do, and no matter what happens from here, we know that we need to approach this situation understanding that this needs to be done God's way. He is the authority on this matter. It isn't about my legal rights. It isn't about my personal desires. And it's not about my feelings. These we need to set down. And the first thing we need to do is, what does God want from this situation? He is the authority here. He has a plan. We can pick up these other boxes in a minute. But the first thing we stand on, the foundation from which we gain peace in a polarized society is Understanding and recognizing that Jesus is the authority. It's this authority that is giving Paul the, the directive to say, you need to do this. It's this authority that he is saying, Philemon, you already know what to do. It is this authority that Jesus brings that is what Onesimus is sending him back to Philemon to make amends. The authority of God trumps everything else, and this is the first step we have to take in order to achieve the peace. Now, what we also recognize, many of us in these situations, perhaps a family member that is completely different than you sees the world very different. It is a struggle sometimes for us to even know where to begin. I haven't talked to that person in 20 years. I have no idea where, where to even begin. It's right here. God is the authority. Jesus is the authority. All right, so let's keep looking. That first point, let's keep watching this. He says that I am sending him, in verse 12, sending him back to you, sending my very heart. We also see I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but for your own accord. Watch this, verse 15. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What we recognize here is our second point, that God has a plan. You see it on the pages here. Paul is hinting at something. He's saying that it's possible that Onesimus, he left all of this struggle, all of the strife, the friction, even the loss of income or perhaps something stolen. We'll see that in a minute. That in verse 15, perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while. God has a plan. He's hinting at that plan right here. He says it may be that this whole challenge, this whole relational dynamic that is brought about was because God was working out salvation in Onesimus' life. What they don't recognize more than likely is as this level letter is traveling, of which there are millions of them all over ancient Rome going everywhere, that this letter was going to be recorded, that there were going to be people talking about this relationship dynamic for thousands of years. Countless millions of people would encounter this whole process and come to know the Lord in a deeper way. Perhaps thousands of people would come to know the Lord and go to eternity because of this, and untold billions of people would have a strategy on how to navigate personal dynamics that are polarizing in a biblical way, bringing peace to a world that does not know what peace even looks like. Imagine, if you will, that this whole process... God had a plan to bring about peace and restoration and harmony and eternal salvation. That's what Paul is hinting at here. And we recognize after looking back over our shoulder for 2,000 years that that's exactly what God was doing. 
God had a plan through this challenge. Now, this is what brings us peace. Whenever we're dealing with a polarized society, this divisive thing and all the relationship dynamics that we struggle with, we have to stop and say, okay, God is the authority here. So whatever I do, the first step, I need to do it in a way that is honoring to God's wishes here. It's not about me, it's about God. The second thing that we see is that God has a plan through this and with this. That's hard for us to grasp. But that one thing gives us an incredible amount of peace. Do you recognize that God brought this problem, this challenging relationship, this divisive nature, he allowed this to happen for him to get glory from it. He knew it was going to happen before you did. He knew that challenge would walk up to you this week. He knew that that would happen, and he knows the outcome of it. What makes it stressful for us is we never saw it coming. We don't know what to do with it, and we don't know how it's going to end. So we worry about it, and we get anxious about it, and we struggle with it. But God is saying, I am the authority, and this is all part of the plan. I've got a plan for this. I'm going to redeem it. God redeems everything that he allows. If you want a stress-reducing process, just recognize that God has a plan through this takes all that tension out of our shoulders as we're working through all the family dynamics and the relationships that we have cut loose over the years because we don't want to deal with that and he brings him back he becomes a believer and he's following the lord this beloved brother that we see in verse 16 you go from this struggle this challenge now he's saying because of christ being the authority because of god's plan now all of a sudden you're beginning to see this budding out of peace of tranquility of harmony of brotherhood this mutual direction toward god his authority his kingdom and he's giving us that taste though there's this division so what do we do from here let's keep reading this in verse 17 he says so if you consider me your partner receive him as you would receive me if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything charge that to my account now we don't know quite what this is paul isn't going into the accounting of this it is likely that in order for onesimus to flee not only is he a purchased person there's an expense that goes with him but he more than likely had to steal something of value currency to get him out because he doesn't own anything so there is some expense or some wrong that he has done to philemon here and paul is saying whatever that is charge it to my account you see that does that sound familiar keep reading with me verse verse 19 <clears throat> i paul write this with my own hand let there be no mistake i will repay it to say nothing of you owing me even your own self doesn't matter what you have to give to me i want to take this on and i want to make sure that this is right verse 20 yes brother i want some benefit from you in the lord refresh my heart in christ We'll stop there for a second. We recognize Jesus is the authority. We understand that he has a plan. And here's the third thing as we're navigating this division of the relationship. We remember that God desires reconciliation. This is what God's design is. We see it play out with Paul, that apostle, that he's saying, whatever the, the problem is, charge it to me. If there's anything I could demand payment from you just because I have shared the gospel, but the reality is I want this to be okay. Charge it to me. God's design for this relationship between Onesimus and Philemon was not for slave owner and slave. It was for brotherhood. It was for mutual cooperation in the gospel. That's God's design in the first place. Paul is pointing that out. But the pages here are dripping with the blood of Jesus Christ. If you go back and look at the story of what God has done through Jesus, we recognize that God's design, number one, was for reconciliation you have an entire people of every race and gender and background all the way back to adam and eve that have gone astray and that are doing their own thing and they are divisive and they are rebellious and god moves heaven and earth to come bring restoration and peace to a troubled people that are full of stress and anger and resentment and bitterness and hopelessness and despair and god is saying i'm coming to take the penalty for 
all of that. I am going to pay it. You are not. I could demand it from you, but I desire reconciliation. So when we engage the problem, we know, okay, no matter what this person has done, no matter what the backstory here is, God is the authority, and I'm going to approach it in his authority, and I'm going to handle this in a means that is honoring to God. The second thing that I know, God has a plan for this. He has a plan for this person. He has a plan for me. This person is literally made in the image of God. He is made, he or she is made in the image of God. God died for him. He has a plan and a purpose to bring about restoration in their life. And he has moved all of heaven to do that. What say of you? I'm going to do the same thing. God's design is for reconciliation. If you're wondering today, and that person in the back of your head you haven't talked to in years, and you're saying, you know, I don't know what to do. Well, we start with saying... God's the authority here. God has a plan for this, but God's desire is reconciliation. We know this is what God's heart is, and as believers, our heart should be a natural bent toward mercy and grace and restoration of the people around us. Now, I want to say this. It may be that there are healthy boundaries. This person may not be a believer. They may be dangerous. It may be something where it's like, I, I can't have you in my house. I can't meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. But I'll tell you this. I'm going to take steps not only to be safe here, but I'm going to take steps to bring this restoration into our life. It may start small, but we're, my natural bent is to bring about restoration because that's God's design. How many people that we have seen their testimonies that perhaps at the very beginning when they encounter grace and they encounter restoration, they're angry. They don't want to buy into that. They don't like God. They don't like anything about it. But when they look back on it 20 years later, after they've come to the Lord, they say, you know, the first taste that I had was here. And it really put me on a track to understand eternal life in Jesus and to turn my life around. And you can be a part of that as well. We remember that God desires reconciliation. Let me ask you this question. We've had these three things. There's one more thing yet. If you were to know this person that you have all this animosity towards seeing the world in a very different way, perhaps somebody you haven't talked to in years, if you were to know that if you picked up the phone today and they were to come to know the Lord as a result of this, it may be a hard hard season as you work through all the challenges but you would know that they would become believers that they would understand who jesus is and for thousands of years people would be looking at that model and shaping their heart to bring about peace and harmony and reconciliation to millions of people for thousands of years would you pick up the phone today and give that person a call the story of philemon onesimus they had no idea how this act of reconciliation was going to impact the lives of so many. God is the authority. He has a plan. And we recognize that his desire is reconciliation. Perhaps this is something that takes the stress off of our shoulders. This person has wronged me. This person is out of bounds. Yes, that may be true. But I'm going to navigate this with the authority of God, understanding this plan. And I'm going to try at least on my end, to reconcile this. So let's keep reading. He says this in verse 21, Confidence of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. I'm sending him back to make reconciliation, but I'm confident you're going to do even more than that. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me that I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus sends greeting to you. So does Mark, Aristarchus, Dim Dimas, Luke, my fellow worker, in grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. He is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, and he's fully expecting Philemon to reciprocate this. There's something that both of these guys are doing that is painful for me to look at. It's painful to me because I'm a very prideful person, as in most of us in this room. But we approach this fourth thing, we approach this situation with humility. If you want to know how to restore a relationship, that final segment is to approach it with humility. If you look at Philemon's perspective here, 
Paul is saying, I know that because you, you love the Lord, God has a plan. God wants to redeem and restore. I know that you're going to give up your legal right. Rome has said that you have this right, but I know that you're going to forego what could be yours defined by the law. You're going to have a humility about this, and you're going to give up something that you think you have a right to for someone's good. Onesimus, on the other hand, he's given up literally his freedom. Nobody knows where he is. He could still stay away and try to escape and, and live the good life, so to speak. But yet he's choosing to go back with risk. A slave returning, he's run away. There's been some expense given. This could cost him. But instead he steps up and says, with humility, I'm going to approach in order to bring about this reconciliation. I am going to approach it. And through this, Paul says, though we don't know the final outcome, what we do know, Paul says, I'm going to come and I'm going to check on you, basically, saying, prepare the guest house. My prayer is I'm going to come and see how it's going. So we recognize that, that these two guys are going to work it out because Paul's going to see to it. The bottom line is when we approach this problem, this, this polarized position with a level of humility, like the images I showed you at the very beginning, we can be looking at the exact same thing and see two different perspectives of the same image. But when we come and we lay down each of those and we approach it with the viewpoint of God and the value of that other person and we know that God desires reconciliation and we bring about a level of humility, I'm willing to set aside my rights in order for this to work to the best of my ability. Sometimes it depends on the other person too, but when they're following these four things, it brings peace in a relationship that has been divided for years. I don't know the condition of the relationships that you have brought in this room today, joining us online. It's really perhaps none of my business. But what I do know is, is that these things can be so stressful and burdensome that we can literally go to our deathbed having never talked to this person again. And there's nothing but bitterness and anger and animosity. And God brought you here today saying that is enough of that. It is time for you to have peace in your heart. And the stress that you carry in your shoulders from all of this polarized fighting and division, we approach it with the authority of God. God has a plan and a purpose for it and through it. And he wants you to act on it with a heart toward reconciliation. And it's easy for us to say, but it takes humility on our part to be the first one to pick up that phone or send a message or to reach out. You may be surprised how far God takes that relationship afterward. And you may be surprised, as I'm sure Philemon and Onesimus sure are, how many thousands of years God has taken the sound of this story into the ears of countless millions of people where they restore their relationships and people wake up after dying in heaven with God because these two guys approached it with humility to bring about restoration. There's two real things that I believe God brought us here today. There's somebody here, perhaps just one, you have never been reconciled to God. You know who he is, you know what he has done, but you don't care. And God is saying, my desire is to restore you and bring peace into your heart, and you don't have any peace. And he brought you here to restore you, and what it's going to take is humility of you saying, I'm ready to surrender to the Lord. If that's you, all we do is we just give our heart to the Lord and say, Lord, this is, this is me. All the stuff that I have done in the past, I lay that down, and you are now Lord of my life. We do that in a prayer. You don't need me. You just need the Lord. If I can help you with it, I'm here, and I'm ready to pray with you and introduce you to somebody who will help walk you through this new beginning of your life. But there's a whole other segment of people here today that you've got relationship drama all over your life. And there are people in your life that you are looking at saying, I'm not ever talking to that person again. There is no restoration here. They have wronged me in every direction. You may need to be very careful in how you do it, but your heart has always needs to be toward reconciliation. And God is calling you today to maybe set down that anger and the, the bitterness that has come from that and begin to approach it with these four key elements from Philemon. If you would... 
in this moment of our, our time to just reflect in prayer, I'm going to allow you to sit in your seats for a little bit, search your heart, whatever God's putting his finger on in your life, and say, Lord, this is the person. These are the things that are causing me stress and grief and struggle, and I'm tired of it. I want to work this restoration out in my life. I want to lay it before you, and I want to approach it knowing that you have a plan, and you just need to spend some time in prayer. If you need the steps to come forward, like you're going to leave it here and, and do business with God, come down, do that, that's fine. But if you're that person that's never known the Lord in your life, I'm going to be here for you. You just let me know how we can best help you. But while the music plays, you do business with God as he has called you to do this morning. time to do business with the Lord, you just keep doing that. We have a connection corner if you make your way out the doors over here. We'd love to pray with you, answer questions that you might have uh, about our church. Uh, a couple things, this is one time where we um, do our offering. You'll see on the screen some ways in which you can give uh, electronically. If you make your way out, there's some uh, little gray boxes on the side of either of the, the doors as you leave. You can drop something off there. Um, you know, it's really interesting being the executive pastor. I see all the checks that we write. In this past week, I got to see money going all over the world to all kinds of ministries that many of them are even clandestine. We can't really talk about it lest the governments there find out the gospel. And so it's just really a fun thing of your generosity. A couple of quick things that I did want to draw your attention to. Uh, if in your pew, you'll see a, a little slide like this with QR codes. If you're a guest or you haven't connected with a grow group, there's a link here where you can see some opportunities where you can connect in a grow group. Try them out. It's okay to go to a different one each week until you find the right fit. Nobody's going to judge you. We just want you to connect and be part of the family. Secondly, there's a Discover Southcliffe class. If you want to be a member of Southcliffe, this is how we do that so that we're fully transparent who we are, what we believe, why we do what we do. We want all those answers those questions answered before you join so you know what we're doing so that's how we do that through that class that's actually happening next week uh, in the fellowship hall so just join us up there no need to rsvp just show up at 9 30 we'll be ready for you finally you as you came in you got something called cliff notes if you didn't get these they're at the welcome desk in the information desk these are events that are coming up some of them are really fun uh, some of them are very serious uh, but at all all points 
These are ways that you can thrive and connect with others in the family. So make sure that you get one of those. Uh, Stu is going to close us in prayer. the right mic sorry hey guys i'm Stu Kokenauer, and uh before we go just want to let you know if you're new to south cliff uh there's folks who'll be out there who'd love to meet you at the connection corner uh great opportunities there's the eclipse party tomorrow just look in your in your um in those cliff notes and let me know if you have any questions about that i'll be at the share center let's all stand and uh let's uh, end our time with prayer father thank you so much for allowing us to be gathered here today to worship you father in spirit and in truth and i pray that the words would go through into our hearts and would become who we are as we live out scripture in our daily lives send us out to be salt and light into this world in your name we pray amen you're dismissed What a great day to be in service. Don't forget, on April 8th, you can be in our parking lot to be able to view the eclipse and celebrate how our God is the one who orchestrates all the cosmos. In fact, if this service meant something to you, email our pastor. He'd love to hear with you and pray with you and encourage you. See you next week online.